going to have a conversation that hopefully will be illuminating for many people here, the useful. And um, one thing I was thinking about is that uh, many of the talks and discussions here is about consciousness uh -huh. and non-duality. And the main import of the uh, presentations throughout the years, because you weren't here <laughs> to put in your, your uh, 10 cents worth, is that if you recognize universal consciousness, mm -hmm. right, if you experience um, and then no self as which is equated with co with consciousness, pure consciousness. Uh, that that is awakening and enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And from what I understand, that leaves something that the Buddha said. Mm -hmm. Something you know, what that the Buddha brought in. Yeah, okay. I was thinking you here, you, you're quite an authority in Buddhism, right? Well, as much an authority as I know. Uh, you know, you're you're a practitioner, but you're also I, I a scholar. To, a very, uh, you, my you, wife is a higher authority than yeah, you. Yeah, you, you, my, my, well, I'm sure at home she probably is. <laughs> <laughs> Could be, but uh, the point is, each tradition, each spiritual teaching, is a little different than the other. They're all bring, trying to bring in freedom, make people happier, freer. Mm -hmm. And each one has an emphasis. Mm -hmm. And Buddha came in with his emphasis, which mm -hmm. became Buddhism, mushroom into many schools right. of Buddhism. And I was thinking that, and Buddhism contributed many things mm -hmm. to the spiritual understanding, to the knowledge of enlightenment. But the thing that Buddhism emphasized more than anything else is emptiness. Yes, of course because no other tradition emphasizes it, although other traditions do mention right. and talk about emptiness, Buddhism made it the central thing. Right. And I thought, and you talked about it some yes. in your talk, but even in, among Buddhists, mm -hmm. emptiness is not an easy thing to understand. It's right. not an easy thing to understand intellectually. It's not an easy thing to understand experientially. Right. So I thought we'll discuss it a little bit <laughs> okay, to, right. to see what is, yes. what is a Buddhist contribution to enlightenment because according to Buddhism, if you just experience consciousness, pure consciousness, that doesn't do it. You have to understand emptiness yes. for there to be true enlightenment. Right. And many of the people who are presenting here, they don't say anything about that. Right. So I thought you'll be the one who to say it, not <laughs> me. And I will... We'll discuss it okay. back, back and forth. So I thought, you know, you did discuss it some, mm -hmm. but I thought we want to get some kind, you know, both an intellectual and somewhat experiential. Yes. What, why, do, why do Buddhists care about emptiness? Because right. the Sophies talk about love. Right. They said love is what does it. Right. You know, the Vedanta says consciousness is what, what yes. does it. But Buddhism says emptiness. Right. So why? Well, what is emptiness? I think from and why do what Buddhists I was saying emphasize before, it so much? Yeah. Uh, actually, you were, you were saying, and I've been reading uh, Almanza's wonderful book called um, The Alchemy of Freedom, which is not yet available to you all, but will yeah. soon be, I, I believe. Yeah, March. Hopefully. And it's really wonderful. And there you talk about true nature. Yeah. And your equivalent of emptiness, ultimate reality, let's say, is true nature, you know? Yeah. And, uh, I think it somehow sneaks around to connect to emptiness, actually. Yeah, yeah. It seemed by the way I was reading. I, I didn't true. read it thoroughly, I do, I, and I'm I not do sure that. I fully understand I do it. That, yeah. And you're, taking a, you're choosing to make a kind of less, a uh, little bit intimidating name for ultimate reality. You know? And, and yeah. uh, I once was a, an elderly gentleman who was a Protestant theologian, who was the grandfather of a student of mine, who, who, with whom I became very friendly. Uh, over some years, and uh, real New England kind of sort of character, you know, and uh, sadly gone, or gone, gone on happily to another life. And he used to say, why don't you call it fullness? You know, why emptiness? And I, he, he used to ask me that. And um, I think the reason is that um, 
that the key to opening and flowering and blooming all of the op all of the wonderful positive things of love and fulfillment and blessings and all of this, the person has to empty their self-centered, closed sense of being and alienate it from everything else. You know, but the the Buddha had a did a clever thing in his era, where he took the expression that was used for a low caste person who couldn't go to the Vedic ceremony, yeah. which is literally called pratakjana, which means a separated person, so like segregated person. Yeah. And so that segregated person couldn't come to the, to the church, basically, which was the Vedic sacrifice. And Buddha took that term for the segregated person, and he said a person who thinks that the only reality, the only real reality to them yeah. at some, on some visceral level is yeah. themselves, yeah. is segregated or alienated from everybody else and from yeah. everything else. Yeah. Because they're, so, they're basically all full of themselves and, they, and they're beyond that, they're alienated from it. So in order to develop a closeness to the other things, you, the first step Buddha felt from the very beginning was to empty to, to face the challenge of the emptiness of the self and um, that, that, that sort of, the, the, which only challenges this sort of ultimate status, the reality status of that self. It doesn't, it, it's misunderstood and he, he, he risked the misunderstanding, he courted the misunderstanding, you could say, uh, that people would understand it as nihilistic, there's no self and people have yeah. massively. Mm -hmm. And therefore, sometimes, for example, certain people would ask him, well, come on, is there a self or not? Ultimately, after nirvana, is there a self in nirvana or not? Let's hear the skinny on self. And Buddha wouldn't answer. And then later, one of his students said, well, well Bhagavan, you know, blessed one, how come you didn't answer him? You always say there's no self. There's no self. And he said, well, no, that guy would have understood that as a nihilistic way. So with him, I emphasized that he has to be responsible about himself and blah, 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 you know, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to do that, so I didn't say anything. So Buddha was always teaching as would be helpful to some particular person. And that's, I think, the reason for emptiness. And, but the key, of course, a key thing about it as we approach it now, especially people who are educated and scientific, is that what, what things are empty of is something that they never did have. You know, in other words, they make a big fuss about emptiness does not destroy anything. It simply clear, helps to clear away the illness and the distortion of thinking that myself is some absolute thing that's separate from everything else. Yeah. So it's a medicine for that. And actually yeah. Nagarjuna says, if you then become to think that emptiness itself is an absolute, then, you, then there's no hope for you. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, although he did teach what he called the emptiness of emptiness, Empty, as you know very mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Actually, Almas is an excellent Buddhist scholar. I have known he read really everything. He knows all complicated scholarly books and things. I think I was very impressed Some. with our personal conversation, previous conversation, bit, yeah. how much you know about it. And uh, so that's the, I think that's the answer that I would give. The emphasis on selflessness and emptiness has to do with the fact that the human being in being intelligent as we are, we don't want to know reality. You know, we want yeah. to know that the light is green before we go across the road because we don't want to get run over. So we want to be realistic. Okay. So but this that, is that, ultimate realism. Is that that the idea that there is no separate self. Yes. That is true to all spiritual. No, absolutely mis separate self. Yeah, yeah no absolutely separate, separate self. Generally, in mystical teaching, it's all true. What differentiates Buddhas from this? He has, yes. Buddha has a contribution to make. It's not just, he did say there's an atma, yes. no separate self, but is he, is emptiness, is only the lack of separateness? Yes, well, oh, well, well but separateness. But you brought in re re relativeness, identitylessness, and all of those. What do these things mean? Yeah, yeah, well, those things mean the reality status of a separate self. In other words, even relatively speaking. Yeah. Even when Buddha, for example, when Buddha achieves uh, Dharmakaya, a right. body of reality where he feels he's everything, right. or she feels there yeah. she's everything, and then uh, she is sort of a field of energy that surrounds everything. For example, from a Buddhist point of view, Buddha is here. Buddha thinks he's you and me. Right. He experiences himself as that. Yeah. But then if you or I need something special, 
that because we can't relate to ourselves and everything around us usually, then he can manifest whatever we, if we needed a parrot to sit there and say, emptiness, emptiness, <laughs> to repeat it to us all day long or something, he could do that. He could make such a thing. It's a, there's a magical element, yeah. totally, you know. And um, I, I, what we might think of as a magical element, once you really understand, if you have a dharmakaya, you can do pretty much everything. You don't need to do anything, but for the sake of others, you could do pretty much anything. So, supposedly, you know. So, um, uh, uh, so it's not just separate in the sense that when we're relative beings, so Buddha can even manifest a separate seeming embodiment or yeah. object or something if necessary. And we have a relative separateness. Yeah. You know, we're not, uh, we're not all in one. Like, for example, non-duality, from Buddhist point of view, encompasses duality. It supports duality. Yeah. And it, it doesn't just destroy it. You know? It doesn't even destroy duality. It supports it. Yeah. But, um, it but it supports it on a different level, on a, on a conventional or relative level. You know? it, it relativizes everything. It, and also, Buddhists, Buddhists don't reject the existence of God or yeah. gods. Yeah. as people wrongly think, but it relativizes them. There's no one absolute one in their view, you know. But yeah. uh, they do that. But yeah, but um, the thing that I'm trying to understand, which I think you could help us understand, is that uh, Buddha wasn't satisfied that the self is gone and everything is consciousness. Right. Went further, he, uh, according yeah. to him, and he saw he he saw that nothing has ultimate existence. The self has no, no ultimate exi absolute existence, and nothing. Ha well, not even nothing does. Yeah, not. I mean, nothing is also Nothing empty. in the world, no <laughs> object has ultimate existence. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, this absence of ultimate existence, what does it mean? Because uh, for many other traditions, they talk about being, pure presence, everything is. Yeah. When, you rec when, when you see the unity of everything is the unity of being. Yes. And the being is existence. Sure. Is a true you, existence. You can say, well, uh, true. Uh, but, uh, well, we would say truthless existence. That's what they say, though. <laughs> they say true ontological uh, reality. I mean, Sufis say that, Vedantists say that, many say that. Buddhism doesn't say that. So that's what I'm trying to see. Yes. What, does, what does it say? Well, because Buddhism wants people to take reality with a pinch of salt. Yeah. That's why Buddha had a sense of humor. You know? Yeah. The people always try to make the, this is a big reality, that's a big reality. Even emptiness is empty, you know. If you think emptiness is ultimate reality, even though in a way it is equated. In a way, you could say Buddha looked for ultimate reality. Yeah. And, he, and ultimate reality also he found to be empty. Yeah. And therefore, ultimate yeah, reality it is, is not, the relative it's, reality. It's, because not something that exists. Yes. But what is it? What do, when we say this table, mm -hmm. or you or me, don't mm -hmm. have this absolute ultimate existence. Right. What do we really mean? Because well, we, it, I mean, it, we just it mean, is not expression of the pure being and consciousness. We could say we could come around and say that. Yeah. If, it, if we were if we were already safe to say that. Yeah. But what Buddha is doing is the fact that by saying that this table lacks ultimate existence, he's expressing what happens if you really analyze the table long before the atomic theory or subatomic yeah. quantum theory. Yeah. The table disappears under analysis, and it, uh, and it so therefore it only has a relative reality. Yeah. But we ha habitually invest in things at an exaggerated quality of reality, yeah. and so that's why we say that it lacks intrinsic existence or intrinsic reality or intrinsic. There's three levels: there's the ontological level, yeah. epistemological level, yeah. and linguistic level, mm -hmm. meaning it has no intrinsic referentiality. The word yeah. table. Yeah. doesn't land on something in there that corresponds to that word. That just happens to be an English conventional word that we understand. It has Chokse in Tibetan, it has Mesa in other languages. Mm -hmm. so, so Buddhism just discovered that. He discovered that. 
And then you can come around to saying that the whole of relative reality is what emptiness is. Yeah. And so in that sense, it, it, the, the insight that it lacks intrinsic reality supports its reality, relative reality. But there's always the danger of our re-reifying and our not realizing the illusoriness and getting trapped again in feeling this is really the table apart from me and I'm really myself apart from everything else. And so there's a, there's a deepening process yeah. where you know the practitioner analyzes, everything disappears, like the thought experiment about the nose that mm -hmm. I mentioned everybody, and then it's back again. And when it first comes back, it seems like, oh, that's like an illusion because I just saw it disappear. And then, but then when I get used to it, then I get, then someone punches me in the nose and then I want to kill them. <laughs> yeah. Because it was an absolute violation kind of thing. So, so, I mean, I still, even if it was only a relative violation, I still might have a bad reaction. But, but you know, the, the, it takes the sting of the excessive reification of an absoluteness in things. That's why it's constantly harped yeah. on. Uh, and, so that's, and, that's the and, thing. and Buddha wanted to avoid the reification of anything, including yeah, he uh, to help uh, people, including the emptiness. Yeah, he didn't exactly. want to reify anything, exactly. including emptiness. Exactly. So when somebody comes and says, "I'm awakened," and I am everything, I am pure consciousness. Yes. Right. They yeah. make it a self again. Yes, that's the danger. Well, yeah. but many traditions think that's enlightenment. Yes, that's right. Buddhists, a Buddhist won't say that. Well, some will. Some, some will. Especially the ones who have the experience and they say, I'm enlightened. Well, but I'm, you know, I'm, in Zen, I'm in, real in, Zen, in Chan, they yeah. have a wonderful expression for a yeah. person who thinks they're enlightened. Yeah. They say, that person got trapped in the demon ghost cave. Right, yes, yeah, exactly. Of the last trap of psychotic egotism. Yeah. Of thinking, I'm enlightened. So that means knowing oneself as pure consciousness, as the infinity of consciousness, doesn't constitute enlightenment, according to Not Buddha. Not necessarily, but it could yeah. be a helpful step. Actually, it's a helpful in the, step. In Mahayana Buddhism, as you know. Yeah, but, but that's, that's what I, my understanding, Buddhism, because there has been debates between Buddhism and other traditions, right. and as a result, Buddhism is saying, yeah, that's right. true, good, but that's not really yet. Right. The, no, the, it the, the, it's not really the final truth. So that's what I thought would be helpful for everybody to hear. What does Buddhism mean by the final truth? Right. You so see? the final truth is not expressible in words. Yeah. The, the, the key thing about the, final, the key thing about the, emptiness and selflessness yeah. is that they are negations. They are via negativa. Yeah. And if you know that a negative cognition yeah. is a less of a closure type of cognition than, than a seemingly affirmative cognition, like yeah. that's the table, so that my mind and my concept seems to really land on it and I think, okay, that's that, that, that that's, I got it there. But a negative one, there's no table in the room. You just look around until, you know, and keep trying to look and then at some point you, give, you decide, well, I've looked enough and there still might be one there somewhere, but your mind basically opens, you never find the non-table. That's why I don't like people who translate it, the non-self. It's yeah. like there's something to be found there, the non-self. You don't find the non-self, you just don't find the self. Yeah. And you could keep looking, but you decide You that don't find anything, what? basically. You don't find anything if you that's, keep, that's keep right. looking, right? So that, that's the realization of emptiness, is just not finding a non-empty thing. And findability. Sometimes. It's called unfindability sometimes. Dalai Lama calls unfindability. Yes. But he, yes, Dalai, Lama, right. Dalai Lama do, does make, make the distinction, which, which, which yes. he just made, yes. between affirming negative and non-affirming yes. negative which yes. is a division even within Buddhism. But that's a bad translation, that I'm sorry yeah. about my colleague. Okay, good. It's a free, it, it is a, an, a, a, an exclusion negation yeah. versus an implicative negation. Uh -huh, in okay. other words, a negation that at the same time implies something else. Yeah. Where exclusion just negates what, what it's negating and it yeah. doesn't imply necessarily anything so, else. That's so very important. From what I understand, but that, that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, you know, sort of differentiate Buddhism from other, many other teachings. Yes. But even within Buddhism, there is a, that, that uh, sort of debate still exists. Oh, yeah, sure. Like between the Rang Tong and Shan Tong. Yeah. Right? But even in that translation, you can yeah. see that guy thinks. Yeah. That negation is not yep. affirming anything. Yes. But the exclusion negation, like Tonkama makes the point, the exclusion negation does 
yeah. affirm what it's excluding. Yes. That it's excluded. Yeah. In other words, it is a cognition that has an aim and a goal, and uh, it, there's no such thing as a non-affirming negation. There's one that implies some other thing. Yeah. But but it still negates its its goal. So, yeah, yeah so that's a very important thing. You know. Yeah, it's very. That's my understanding, and that's one thing I appreciate yes. from studying Buddhism. Yes. And uh, which brings in uh, two questions or yes. two, two themes in yes. my mind, which I think we could discuss. One of them is we're talking about emptiness, trying to understand, and so far we're discussing it. You could say conceptually or intellectually. Yes. But I imagine it is experienceable. One can experience that condition yes, of, course. Of, yeah. of emptiness of, of everything. Right. So that's uh, one thing we can discuss. And we can discuss it within the context of the division within Mahayana Buddhism. You know, I don't know whether, how much it exists now between the Rangtong and Shantong. Between Rantong and Shantong. Oh yeah, that's still that's a strong thing. Still, still going, going. Yeah, yeah, right. And yeah, it would be good because, because that's for me. I found it very interesting when yeah. I was studying that. It was very informative to me. Yeah. And 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 my view when I studied the debate and yes. this one trying to prove this one, I liked both of them. You liked both of them. I like both of them. I experienced both yeah. to be true. Yes. That's my experience. Well, that, you is, is and the Dalai Lama are the same then. Huh? You and the Dalai Lama are similar in that. Then. Yeah, I, like, I, 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 although I, there's both two versions. Are, my experience is both true. There's, called, uh, there's yeah. called good Shentong and bad Shentong. Oh, I see. Maybe you and, could tell us more. And what's good the Shentong. What, what, maybe we could take, talk about what's the difference between Shentong and Rangtong so people yes. can know what, we, what those terms mean. Means, uh, yeah. Shentong means that um, other emptiness it's called, and Rangtong means self-emptiness. Yeah. And actually, those who are accused by the Shentong parts, the other emptiness people of yeah. the Rangtong, don't consider that they are Rangtong, actually. They don't consider that the case. Yeah. In other words, you know, a, a, the argument is a vase is empty of being a vase. You know, they, they call that self-emptiness. But the, the uh, person who is accused of being a self-emptiness person says, I don't say the vase is empty of being a vase. I say the vase is empty of being an intrinsically real vase. It yeah. still is a relative vase, so it's yeah. not empty of being a vase. Yeah. So, so they deny that, that charge by the other emptiness people. The other emptiness say that emptiness is, they resist the idea of the emptiness of emptiness. Yeah. They want to have emptiness to remain an absolute apart from the relative. And they want to be able to therefore attain enlightenment in a sudden manner and they feel that the body of a Buddha and the powers of a Buddha and the ability to teach and to do things and to change, shape the world to benefit others are automatically present in emptiness and they come at you. My latest analogy for the Shendomba is yeah. Iron Man. Um, <laughs> Have you seen the recent Iron Man? I don't know, you may not, you may no, not watch I, that. I've seen many of the Iron Man. Well, I don't know if I've ones, seen there's so many of in them. In the recent but, ones, he uh, often, he has a high tech thing Mm -hmm. where the Iron Man suit shows up at the right minute. <laughs> He'll fling himself off a building and then he presses his watch or he has kind of a mechanism in his heart, yeah. in his chest. And then the suit shows up mm -hmm. and clack, 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 and it's all on him right away. I see, it comes, and saves yeah. him from dying from right, falling. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. so the suit that, yeah. is waiting there outside in reality. And so the Buddha suit, you know, like... Yeah. You know, the body of the Buddha, the, the sort of seemingly supernormal powers of the Buddha. I never say supernatural, supernormal powers of the Buddha. In other words, they come with the realization of emptiness. Whereas the, 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 the general view, yeah. which I also follow, and the Dalai Lama really does, but he wants to appreciate a version of Shem Tong that doesn't hit that too hard, yeah. is that you have to earn the suit by evolutionary action. You, know, you have to develop the body through compassionate activity. You can accelerate that in Tantra by, by living and dying many times in a subtle plane, but you still have to go through the process of dying and being reborn in ever more evolved uh, forms, which the Bodhisattva is really to do for like three big bang to big crunches, you know, three kalpas. Yeah. But, the, but the, tantrika, the Tantric Bodhisattva wants to hurry it up 
So they can do in 16 lives, seven lives, even in one life, the extreme case, like a Milarepa or somebody. Yeah. So, so that's the argument. The argument is, is the emptiness really an absolute or is emptiness only a rela relational, in a way, a relational absolute or rather the statement that the absolute is the relative, really? I mean, I, what, what I remember in my studies and partly reading the mm -hmm. Dalai Lama, he was making the distinction between emptiness of self and other in terms of the ultimate. Yes. About what is the ultimate? Uh, what is the ultimate truth? What is the ultimate truth? What oh, is yes, the absolute right, right, right. truth? And he was making a distinction between the Buddhists who think the ultimate truth, the absolute truth is emptiness, yes. and those who think the ultimate truth is awareness. Yes. And, right. and, the, and the Shantong tend to be more the people who think it's they awareness, to, well, yeah. and they say awareness is empty. I know. It, it has the essence of emptiness, but awareness is the ultimate. Right. It's an empty awareness. Right. While the Rangtong, like the, the Gelugpa, the, the Dalai Lama school, they said no, emptiness is really the absolute truth. Right? So it's a very subtle kind of distinction. So they're so they're probably, both using it's emptiness. It's yeah, not that so, subtle well, let's, let's, let's make, make, it, make, make it more the explicit then. There is a resistance to, yeah. to really being committed to the relative as where your absolute concern lies. Uh -huh. When you're really committed that your absolute concern lies in the relative, that means you're really committed to compassion. And because uh -huh. that means you can't escape from it in a certain way. And, but, and you, you, you are committed to the, the quality of the life and the being of all other so beings. So are you saying then, in this case, people like Mahamudra and Dzogchen are not that committed to compassion? Well, no, there are ways of doing Mahamudra and Dzogchen where, yeah. uh, where it's just like what's called Dzogrim uh -huh. But anywhere where they get into the idea that the ultimate is just being some sort of spaced out situation, that is actually no, not... No, I, I, don't, I don't think... Uh, it's not my understanding they're talking about a spaced out situation. Well, let me try to see. If, uh, I'll tell you my understanding, and you correct me. Because okay, well. you, you, you probably know better. <laughs> the, the way I understand it, which is both from studying and from my... Sure, own, sure, you're or, a big scholar, and I agree. My own, my own experience that. is that I can experience thing, everything as pure awareness, a yes. pure conscious or awareness, that everything is a manifestation of awareness, yes. right? And because of that, nothing exists on its own. It's all just simply the radiance yeah. of awareness. Yeah. However, there's another step, which is that this awareness is empty. It's not something that exists. It's, it's yes. not something we can reify. Yes. It's not something, say, Okay, this is aware, and awareness is awareness is can also be experienced as uh, empty in the sense it's transparent, it has no weight, it doesn't have uh, a kind of of, of an well, existence no. that you makes can't really us tell say us that. If, yeah. if it's the only thing that there is, yeah. and then it, there are manifestations, but they get reduced to awareness right. by the person who's in that condition or in yeah. that view then it's pulling to itself all the weight. Yes. Awareness absorbs all the weight yes. in the sense that it's manifesting everything. Yeah. And uh, that is a very valuable view. Yeah. And it is, it's considered the entry-level view of the Mahayana, the universal right. vehicle. Right. And one point that they don't make, the, the yeah. Tibetan philosophers or even the Indian ones, uh, Asanga does a little bit in India, but yeah. for some reason because the Tibetans or thinking of Vijnanavada, the mind-only school, or consciousness-only yeah. school, yeah. and the centrist school, the Madhyamaka, the middle way school, or I call it centrist school, they are thinking of them as sort of you know, philosophical, scientific, ideological worldviews, and they don't get involved in sort of practice side in, in yeah. thinking about those. But in fact, the one that emphasizes that all is awareness, yeah. it, that gives the person the courage to say, I'm going to transform this whole world of suffering into a Buddha world right. where all beings will be free of suffering. Because somehow the world seems more malleable and transformable when it seems to be the more ethereal stuff of consciousness, you could say. Yeah. And so it's a very valuable view. But, and actually the centrist 
in a way, it doesn't really refute it, I think, the knowledgeable one. They, some yeah. do it, some say, oh, those, I, those, those mentalists or those idealists, we don't want them. But the, the, the intelligent ones, like Tsongkhapa, do not. They say that's a great worldview. Yeah. And actually, the centrists all still agree with it. Yeah. But they just say, if it's all consciousness, then it's more convenient to say there are other things outside of consciousness. First thing that's outside of my consciousness are other beings' consciousness. And then the second thing that would be more convenient to meet others' consciousness on are some sort of conventional external objects. Ultimately, there's no objects and ultimately there's no consciousness. But relatively, there is consciousness and objects. But within the, within the, the lesson that they learn from the, from the mind-only people or the consciousness-only people yeah. of the fact that consciousness is completely enfolding all the material things, Right. And then that leads to what is made esoteric and is not, and we, you know, the Dalai Lama never brings this up with the scientists except only in hintingly, mm -hmm. because he doesn't want their, to, to, to enable their triumphal materialistic or reductionistic triumphalism. And that is at the super subtle level in Tantra, yeah. the super subtle mind and the heart center only for the living person. Yeah. But, but everyone enters it at death, you know, in, in certain yeah. states. But that mind is, there's no difference between mind and matter. Yeah. So you can say it's all mind, you can say it's all matter. Yeah. Either reductionism can be relatively useful in certain contexts, but there's no final, it's not like finally this or finally that. Yeah. So there, you can't discern a difference. So they don't want, he doesn't want to, he doesn't bring this. So, so therefore, one of the, in one of the mind and life meetings, one of the philosophers of science present with some of the scientists, he said, well, your holiness, or actually, no, it wasn't him, it was one of the neuroscientists. He said, well, your holiness, we'll go back to our labs and stuff and we'll try to think really strongly how a non-material thing can causally influence matter. You know, how, in other words, how non-matter can matter. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I was there and I said, Actually, it's not a problem of non-material to matter at the yeah. super subtle, sort of most advanced, even practically esoteric yeah, level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of super subtle to coarse. How right. does the subtle yeah. affect the coarse? Right. Because at some point, there's no meaning to say it's yeah, all Yeah, so the coarse is, it's not like the coarse doesn't exist, but there is the super subtle. Yeah, exactly. And the super subtle affects the coarse. Exactly. Yeah. Just like, yeah. you know, quantum people have yeah. gotten to where yeah. the wave, you know, wave particle spooky action at a distance, etc. There's a, there's a plane of subtleness where they can't really say anything about it, but yet they don't deny that it's there. And so, that's the plane that the, that mind exerts its power, but so, it doesn't differentiate it. So it's just it is energy. So, so so it makes me wonder. Also, excuse me. Let me yeah. just follow up with that. Yeah. In the the E equals M C squared thing. Yeah. Was not sort of common knowledge or common convention yeah. in those ancient times. Right. So they were making a difference between static solid matter and energy, yeah. and they never in ancient times did they deny that mind had energy. Never. Yeah. Yeah, so it makes me wonder, you know, the kind of distinctions you're making, you know, about to um, about awareness. Everything is awareness, yes. and the question of relativity, and how that uh, the Rang Tong wants to care about relativity and say emptiness is more really emptiness as uh, that doesn't exist em em empty emptiness is more the absolute reality and instead of saying awareness absolute reality, it makes me wonder how is the experience is difference how, between, does, how is the experience is difference between the two the, well the, how, think, is there experiential difference between the I two think so. or is it a conceptual I think there difference, is an experiential difference well that's that's one thing would be I interesting think, i think to, the experiential difference is yeah that um, when you, uh, you, are, you have forewarned, in a way, through reasoning, yeah. that when you have an experience of infinite space, let's say, yeah. which is a very releasing type experience at first, and very um, seductive, therefore, that you somehow are guarded against reifying that as an absolute, as you hit the absolute there, although many things that you would read in your culture would predispose you to think 
some vast infinity type of like a sense of infinity is absolute is an absolute. Yeah. And so if you're forewarned about it, you can let yourself go in it, in, in the experience. But you are. It's easier the return to where differentiated things loom up again. Yeah. And then the memory of the experience, uh, you realize it wasn't the absolute. But in a way, it, is a, it's, it, was, it was like a deeper way of dealing with these relational things. And he makes, Zongva makes a wonderful point that when you, when you come back into what is called the dreamlike aftermath samadhi, yeah. uh, after you've had the space-like equipoised yeah. samadhi mm -hmm. experience, and the dreamlike aftermath, and it's called dreamlike because you, at first, when you first have had the other experience, your, your subconscious reifying habit of intrinsic reality habit sees those things and feels to yourself to be as if you had some sort of status, reality status as separate things. Yeah. So, but then, but this time you've seen them disappear. You've had, you remember they disappear. Yeah. So, you, so you completely don't go for it and you realize that it's like an illusion what you see. You but, see? But, but, but I but, thought... But, 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 uh, let, me, let me finish. Yeah, so okay. then though, the idea is there's an oscillation for yeah. some people, yeah. back and forth for the practitioner, yeah. and then there finally is an experience that we cannot describe in words, where you see things relationally as present, and yet you know totally they are not there in the way they seem, and therefore you leave them you leave you, you leave them open in a certain way, and also you can embrace them in a certain so, you relate uh, to them very differently. Does that mean you're, you're experiencing them in two different ways at the same time? Yes, and it's, and the, it's and the not metaphor, just it's the best not, metaphor. Yeah, there's a metaphor for it. Okay, which which still makes leaves it inexpressible, but this is yeah, a metaphor. Yeah. It's my mm -hmm. favorite. And that is a mirror perception. Yeah. When you see a reflection in a mirror, you see your own face in a mirror, mm -hmm. you don't pay any attention and you don't rethink that this is a mirror reflection. You don't reach in to shave the face you see over there in the mirror. Yeah. You shave this one. Yeah. You flip right and left even and you don't think about yeah, it. Yeah. Because there is an underlying intuition, uh, already a direct oneness with the reality of its being a mirror reflection yeah. that you don't have to renew which sort of underlies your concern with the relational particulars of what you're seeing and so your mind is is creating is holding that cognitive dissonance without any strain but but that, does that mean when we say experiencing two things at the same time does that mean we are experiencing and understanding emptiness at the same time as we experiencing everything similarly the way most people experience them we can say that uh, are we saying that or are we saying we say something that, different but, than that but in a way you can also say that you never experience emptiness in the yeah. sense that what experiences it is just as empty as what it is and therefore because emptiness the way, is nothing there's no you no, to experience it yeah because nothing um, emptiness they, is nothing they do, they do express that like but they talk about knowing by way of not knowing which you should like that one yeah <laughs> Yes. Knowing by the method yeah. of not knowing. Yeah. And like, see, or in the sutra, Vimalakirti says, the, the final understanding of the object is its non-perception. Yeah. That's the see, final see, understanding the, of the way I, I understood the, you know, the Rang Tong or yes. Dalai Lama perspective, yes. when I said, well, which I might be wrong, I'm open to it, is that emptiness is nothing in its own it's because it's empty but it's more like something that is inseparable from everything else. Yes. It characterizes everything. Yes. Just like wetness is a characteristic of water. You can't have water that's not wet. It's sort of, yeah. Right? So yeah. water is wet. So reality is wet, but it's wet with emptiness. Yeah. So emptiness characterizes everything. And this emptiness, including itself, though. including its, yeah, because it's nothing, wetness is a characteristic of water. There's no emptiness, there's no wetness by itself. Right. Right? They have yeah. to have wet yeah. something. Yeah. But we can't have just wetness. Yeah. The same thing. Emptiness is like, that's how I understand emptiness. Yeah, it's something right. that characterizes the self, the body, awareness, everything. Yes. Everything is characterized by the fact it doesn't, really exists the way we usually think of existence. And that opens up perception and it brings the liberation and a kind of freedom, we could call it 
you know, freedom from suffering, or, but it changes perception. Yes, sure. Uh, perce percep uh, or let's put it this well, way. Well, for example, you, like yeah. I, not yeah. that, for having a full, such a full non-dualist understanding. Yes. I, although I, have, I can logically understand exactly this, these vectors of expression that you yeah. say, yeah. I don't feel I am you as much as me. Yes. I feel more me than I am you than than you. Yeah. But if I was a Buddha, I would be just as much you as me. Yeah. So and, the, the, and, and, and and everyone else too at the same time, which would yeah. be very disconcerting. Yeah. <laughs> it would be really disconcerting. You know, I often say that. But I think what? it's emptiness that leads to that. My sense. Yes, it does. Bec because emptiness is, I, I can see and feel that emptiness is characterizes me, the table, and you. Because of that, and emptiness is nothing in particular, there is no distance between you and me. I am inside you and you're inside me. Yes, that's right. That's right. We but, are inside each so other. You, because, you, because, you emptiness, about the experience. Because, the, because emptiness is not space, because space will have distances. It's, it's amazing. Right? It's like, it's like if, you had a, if you had a kind of weird technological mask, yeah. you know, and you, and you have two eyes, but the mask multiplied so you were seeing, you know, it had a lot of little mirrors inside the mask and you were seeing as if you had like 20 eyes in all directions simultaneously. Yeah. And uh, the, 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 the things were streaming into your eye yeah. optic So, so that, brings like in the, uh, uh, Hawaii, that brings in the Hawaiian perspective. Yes, sure. And now, uh, one flower thing, ornament, yes. Which, uh, I'm curious about this here. Uh, you probably know it better than me. The Hawaiian idea Yes. about the Li and Sheh, and yes. because of Li, every Sheh includes all, each phenomenon yes. includes all other phenomena. Yes. Is that included in any part of Tibetan Buddhism? Yes, that's Which in part Tantra. of Buddhism? Which that's in, well, of course, the Sutra is a Sutra. That yeah. is, is totally... Uh, I know it started from the Sutra, but I, I don't see, I, don't, I never read the Tibetan, Tibetan book. Thing. Originally yeah. Indian. It's originally and Indian, And then right? when Tsongkhapa was on his five-year, six-year yeah. enlightenment retreat in his 30s, yeah. uh, he, 30s and first, uh, for, up to 41, he, that was the one sutra he had with him, was the Flower Ornament Sutra. He had yeah. that with him. But he was reading more Madhyamaka and, and yeah. Guya Samaja and Tantra yeah. and uh, Nagarjuna and Tantra, Chandra Kirti and Nagarjuna and Tantra. So, uh, so the sort of magical side of relativity uh, was more emphasized in that sutra, and that's more used in the tantra than yeah. in the than in the than in um, the Madhyamaka philosophy. But the Madhyamaka philosophy, the way he understands it, is completely one with that. Actually, well, it, well, it enables. Well, it. it's based on the, on the emptiness. Yeah, I, I understood like the the Chinese, uh, uh, you know, uh, Buddhists, they relied on emptiness to yes. understand what yes. we call interpenetration. They have the three steps, yeah. wonderful, yeah. by Dushun, you know, yeah. the famous commentary. Yeah. First is to see true emptiness, yeah. or the altered reality as emptiness. Yeah. And the second one is the non-mutual, non-obstruction yes. of ultimate and relative, what they exactly. call principle and phenomenon. Right. In English, uh, you know, mm -hmm. Lishur Uai. Yeah. And then the ultimate one is Shushu Uai. Yeah. Non-obstruction of one phenomenon and another uh, phenomenon. Right, yes. And that's the holographic one, and that's the more hard, difficult and, one. And that's what quantum theory is trying to explain. What, yeah. Quantum theory, they have yeah. this idea of entanglement. They call it entanglement or non-locality, which is yes. two, they talk about two particles far away, but they to, uh, behave <laughs> as if they are, they are inside <coughs> each, each other. One thing that comes to mind here, since yes. we're talking about emptiness and... Uh, no, and the experience of emptiness yeah. is one thing I hear, and you probably can correct me, and supposedly from reliable sources. As you know, many lamas these days are teaching Dzogchen. Yes. And I heard it from some place, I don't know if it's true, that it was a conscious decision made by the, many of the lamas after they came to the West, US and Europe, they found out that people weren't getting the emptiness teaching, and they decided to teach Dzogchen. They thought that's maybe easier for Western to accept. Uh, I, don't, I don't see it that way. Did, did you hear anything like that? I mean, I hear that. Well, my my was... view of that is the following. 
Yeah. That the lamas who not only teach Dzogchen, but they also give what are called unexcelled yoga tantra initiations pretty yes. easily, mm -hmm. pretty freely. And uh, what that is, is noticing that the Western people uh, are demanding consumers and they want to see the whole kielbasa right away. Yeah. And the Dzogchen and the Anixel Yoga Tantra High yeah. Yogas yes. are the ultimate fruition R right. practice. And they want to know that it's there. Yeah. But the responsible Nyingma teachers, for example, who teach Dzogchen, uh, they will give you a kind of initiation, introduction, what they call pointing out instruction of Dzogchen. But yeah. then, for the serious ones, they have what they call preliminaries. Preliminaries. <laughs> they come back to the preliminaries. <laughs> I, I, I know, yes. 100,000 prostration, 100,000. Well, I mean, the, the, and well, then lam, a kind of lamrim, what they call yes. Kunsan Lama yeah. yeah. the words of my perfect teacher. The ones who become and, serious. And, they, and they impermanence that. Yeah, and yeah, emptiness yeah. and yeah. compassion and, and bodhisattva vows and etc. etc. And so, same as the Anixal Yoga Tantra one. Like yeah. Dalai Lama always says, oh, you came mm. to get the high yoga tantra initiation. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm tricking you yeah. because the more important thing is the preliminary Shantideva yeah. guide to the Bodhisattva way of life that I'm teaching you. That's the really right. important thing that right. you can really use. Right. The other one is like a blessing you'll get to, let's right. hope. Right. Yeah. But only the very advanced one. And then he even says, I'm not really qualified so to give it. To, You're not to qualified us. to get it. Yeah. <laughs> But it's, it's, it was people basically, feel, it's, people it's feel basically the is a way to, it's a, it's a way to get people involved, you're yeah. saying. So that's because yeah. that's their notice. Of and, and especially that they say Dzogchen is for the most, uh, most intelligent. Yeah. And so everybody who thinks they're smart, they're they, they, they <laughs> Dzogchen because all, all yeah, for smart people, while uh, from my understanding, Dzogchen, when they say most intelligent, they don't mean smart, mental smart. Right. They mean the most prepared. Yeah, but you know, those receptive. advanced yeah. things are also said to be dangerous because, you know, they, like even, for example, in Buddha's own time, according to our view, not moderate Western scholars, they have a different yeah. view. Yeah. Because Western scholars of Buddhism, they operate under the Western university preconceived idea that there is no such thing as an enlightened person. That's very, that's step one. That's cardinal step. Yeah. There's no such thing. So therefore, it's just people believe so and so is enlightened, and then they start a movement. So that's really that's it. That's absolutely it. If you don't, if you contradict that, you're a heretic. Yeah. In academia, so the but in the Buddhists say, Buddha taught Mahayana and Vajrayana himself. Shakyamuni right. Buddha did. Right. But he said Mahayana itself is going to be should be kept a little esoteric, secret. Mm -hmm. I told it to you, senior mm -hmm. monks, and to some people. But for about 400 years, I don't want it widely spread in India because I want you guys to build the monastic schools to give people a start, you know, on the ground foundation thing. And then when the, when the Mahayana comes out, those same people who did that were big tantric practitioners themselves. And they said, we're not publishing not a single text for 700 years, mm -hmm. from around 100 before the Common Era to 600. So it was kept era. as esoteric. But then it was kept intentionally as esoteric. Yeah, no text and, mm -hmm. or you know, completely mm -hmm. unpublished and right. completely out of circulation. Right. Whereas the Westerners then say, oh, that's because they made it up later, and then they pretend that Buddha did it, because they're always saying nobody could think ahead 400 years, and nobody yeah. would see the evolution of beings in that way which is disre disregarding Buddha's own claim that when you become enlightened, you not, not only identify with all of beings in space, also all time. So you're present in all past, present, and future. You, you're, they say, triadvanya, dwelling yeah. or knower of the three times, you know, and that's one of the epithets of enlightenment. I, I think what, what you're saying about uh, people who get into Dzogchen because of a consumerism kind of yeah, perspective, well yeah. because it's the highest supposedly yeah. attainment, everybody wants the high, and they think yeah. that... Well, it's, the, it's no higher that, than the unexcelled yoga time. Yeah, it's Same. not, I understand. Yeah. And, but they believe they're smart, and, and, and they tend to be grandiose, right. and, and they're smart. And some of them are, actually. I'm, and I'm actually, I don't are. discount that yeah. there may be some yeah. who had who had previous experience, tremendous in previous yes, lives, yes. and who get it really fast. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, there are a lot of Tibetans were killed in the last 50 years, yes. unnaturally, a lot of monks. Yes, yes. And the best way to immigrate somewhere without having to get a visa and be on a waiting list right. and get past Donald Trump, uh -huh. the, be the best way to immigrate is to take birth in the womb of a nice American lady right. in a good neighborhood. 
That's the, that's the easiest immigrational strategy. Silicon Valley is not, not a bad place. What? Know. Silicon Valley is not a bad place. <laughs> that's, yeah. right. that's right. The Tibetans call it a womb shot. Yeah. Like you have moon shots. Yeah. In America, mm -hmm. you have moon shots. Moon shot, yeah. And you have a womb shot in your inner psychonaut, you know, a Buddhist psychonaut. So an another thing I, I was want to check with you. So mm -hmm. that thing. So sounds you're saying that there has been a conscious intention to teach Dzogchen because of the way the Western mind is. Yes. It, it was intentional. Well, the, there's another the aspect too. Yeah. I think another aspect in the case of Dalai Lama, like Dalai Lama asked me to translate a number of very advanced tantric yeah. books. And for in the you know and the, his teachers who were my teachers also some of them yeah uh, they said what you're translating that you should absolutely never translate that what are you doing blah 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 yeah. and then they would sort of pull back and say well if Dalai Lama asks you I guess <laughs> well you know like that and he, his reasoning I think is that in partly engaging with scientists and partly there is such a bad reputation of Tibetan Buddhism that when he first came out in the 60s, early 60s, yeah. even other Buddhists have like Japanese, Chinese, they think Tibetan Buddhism is some kind of shamanism, Lamaism, it's not real Buddhism, it's some sort of, and Tantra is some sort of sex and weird rituals and it's not the real thing. And even in Indian historians, they were freaked out because the ones who started studying Buddhism were in the 19th century and they were kind of Victorianized. You know, they went, the great scholars, Indian ones, went to Oxford and this and that. So they were like embarrassed about, you know, the unconscious, you know, Eros and Thanatos being discovered in the unconscious thousands of years ago in India, you know, Freud's Eros and Thanatos. Yeah. They were, so, so he had to redeem the idea, that His Holiness had the task, which he has amply and beautifully accomplished, to redeem Tibetan Buddhism as the matrix of the, of the full form of Indian Buddhism yeah. that it reached after a thousand years of changing Indian society and permeating in yeah. certain ways and developing a very gentle and wonderful refined society, uh, uh, yeah. which was then unfortunately what happens to refined societies is they're vulnerable to their militaristic neighbors who are less refined. And that's what happened, you know, that's what happened to yeah. India a thousand yeah. years ago. Yeah. So, um, uh, so uh, so I think that's part of the thinking. It isn't only consumers. It's also letting people know this is a vast, amazing, different civilization with its own sciences and yeah. its own knowledge and so forth. But now listen, you've been asking me to comment on things. How about telling us a little bit about the diamond way? Come on, I want to ask you. What about this true nature? That teach us, teach us about that. True nature? True nature. True nature. Yeah, True yeah. nature. And, and you have this wonderful, yeah, you have yeah. hierarchical <laughs> path and non-hierarchical path. And yeah. The non-hierarchical is the Dzogchen equivalent or parallel or something. Yeah. I, don't know, I don't know. Please tell us. Yeah, we, we could, we could it's time talk, for you talk to about it me. a little bit. Uh, because I know it very much. I'm not interested in talking about it as much. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know very well. You're much better. I'm a worse scholar in your thing than you are in the, in the Buddhist thing, for sure. Well, I mean, I that. know my stuff, and you, yeah, you well, know, you know Buddhism it. very well. Yeah. But before I get into that, I, I want to ask you about another thing, okay. another question. <laughs> because, because I'm trying to find the, right, ins right. the inside story. What's that? The inside story. I want to find the inside story. Oh, inside story about Yeah, what? because okay. you know the inside story. You're pretty involved with yeah. Tibetan Buddhism. You know the inside story. Oh, my story? What? No, not no. yours. Oh, good. Okay. The inside That's story right. of Tibetan Buddhism. Yeah, okay. How it comes to the West. Yeah, yeah. Right? And because the Lamas don't always say it. The Lamas don't always say what is, what's their intention. Just like we discussed about the introduction of Dzogchen, what's it about? And I yes, think yes. you gave two good cogent reasons, yeah. you know, which helped me understand it. Another thing I hear about from, you know, I was involved in many lamas, and some of my friends been involved in lamas and Rinpoches for decades. Right, and right. one thing they hear, they keep telling me, which I, I didn't know if it's true, they said the way the lamas have found out, they discovered, is that uh, Europeans are more serious about practice than Americans. And because of that, yes. they come to the U.S. first to get known. 
uh-huh. to get known in the media and in the books yes, yes. and all of that, but they established their long-term meditation centers in Europe. Uh-huh. Because the Europeans are more tend to be more committed on the long term, I see. and I they see. are as a result a better student uh-huh. for for okay. for the Dharma to continue. Yes, N- not absolutely, but in general, right. that they find the Europeans right. more willing to stay with things in the long term. While American is more like. Try thing, you know, yes. consumerism, just like Apple, you know, yes. the iPhone, you have, you have a new one then, you know, they, they don't stay with the same thing, <laughs> right? And right. so I was wondering, and my understanding, what I hear is that the Lama, they didn't know that at the beginning, but by coming to the U.S. and going to Europe, that's what they discovered. Yes. Have you heard that story? Uh, well, is, anything, uh, is there any truth to it? Yes. I don't know. I mean, I'm not I, sure I, about I, that. Yeah. But... Um, I know this, and that is that uh, they got, it was easier to go to Europe. Uh, like the Dalai Lama started going to Europe in the early 70s. Yeah. But he couldn't get a visa here because of China and geopolitics yeah, through both that. Kissinger and Brzezinski. Yeah. He couldn't get a visa here till 79. We, we sort of, yeah. it was a very difficult, but the last days of Carter, we kind of got, a, we finally got yeah. him a visa. And um, so, uh, but you know what, it, what your question reminds me of, or your, your interest here reminds me of, there was a famous Japanese Buddhist scholar who was a scholar of Tibetan and Sanskrit, uh, Nagao, his name, Nagao, uh, 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 Gaijin Nagao, Nagao Gaijin. And he gave a, a lecture in Los Angeles years ago about the five great renaissances in Buddhism. And four of them were in uh, India, and China and Japan. He didn't like, Tibet. he didn't include Tibet even though he studied Tibet because he mm-hmm. didn't like Tantra. He was from a, he, he liked only Sutra kind of teaching. He had, because in Japan, they are, they are a little nervous about Shingon, you know, the other Buddhist groups are. So I, I argue with him about that. But anyway, when he got to the fifth, yeah. those people in the audience who were still awake, because it was a very slow type of <laughs> Japanese professorly delivery, <laughs> but those people who were still awake were like, he sort of stopped himself. And then they were like, what's the fifth one? What's the fifth one? And he said, well, the fifth one could be with Buddhism coming to America and the West, he said. And then everybody sat up, bolt upright, and what did you mean by that? He said, well, what he meant by it was that in, the, in Asia, Buddhism had become, not only in China was it overrun by communism, China, Mongolia, and Tibet at the, by then, but also, and Vietnam even, but also uh, it had become a routine thing, a religious thing, and it was like a family priest, and it was this and that, and the monks were like, since the Meiji era in Japan, the Zen monks are like householders, basically they marry, there's no monks really, etc. Yeah. And because the Meiji government tried to disempower the monastic communities and so on, it was successfully did so. And uh, so he said, it sort of doesn't really mobilize the population there, but you Americans are kind of crazy and you're looking for a meaning to life. And so serious practitioners do emerge who are kind of mm-hmm. desperate to deal with the question of life and death. He was right. really thinking in Zen terms. Yeah. But he said, then you getting really serious and then this will then feed back into Asia and then some younger generations in Asia will start taking their own tradition really seriously and that will have a uh-huh. huge Renaissance impact, as he's saying. Yeah. But he was trying to exclude Tantra, which I yeah. question. And I said, no, you have to include in the, in the seventh century, not just Tang Dynasty, you have to include Pala Dynasty and the Tantric flowering in India, and then which moved to Tibet. And then in the 14th century Kamakura period, you have to include the Tibetan Renaissance of the 14th and yes. 15th century, mm-hmm. with the beginning of the Dalai Lamas and the Karmapas and the whole thing. And um, he was reluctant, but he kind of conceded that actually, finally. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, that was a few years ago when Tibetan was not as well established here as yeah. Zen was. So, so I think that, uh, I don't know to compare American and European, but um, Euro-Americans are kind of transplanted and de- alienated and displaced Europeans. Euro-Americans are. Yeah, yeah. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, we're just beginning to get more Latino-Americans and black Americans. And, and the Asian-Americans sort of kept separate from the Euro-American crazy post-60s yeah. Buddhist practitioners, yeah. you know, like my, myself. You know, 
my experience, I mean, I don't know about the Tibetan, but my experience, I, I teach both in Europe and yes. here, is that my experience is that in the U.S., when I teach, especially new group, people spend a great deal of time trying to make sure they're not wasting their money. Yes. By testing the teacher, having all kinds of questions. But they do that in Europe, you in, 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 No, oh, in, in the US. US. Yes. In Europe, the way they do it, they don't want to waste their money in a different by getting into it. Yes. They get into the teaching right away. Yes. And they really apply themselves completely. They're not questioning, they're not sort of doubtful, they're sort of ambivalent. Yes. In the US, you find more of that. Yes. It takes a while before the students really open up and yes, yes. trust and commit. Yes. The Europeans, you see, they're, they're easy. Well, you know, there is the thing. Yeah. There is the thing that uh, in Europe, you know, still, although it's now distant and people are born yeah. after that, yeah. but they did have a terrible war on their yeah. territory. So that might have affected so, things. Yeah. So they kind of take things more seriously, like 90% vote in many countries yeah. in the politics. They don't want bad leadership. And America has become... We're poisoned by the food industry. So everybody is, is McDonald out of their body. They're, they're poisoned by the drug industry. Everyone is on antidepressants and whatever they want. They're like confused by the media. They're like, as you say, they're iPhoned up a storm. So we yeah. have become kind of weakened as a population. And maybe now we're just going to recover, I think. We're going to have a new renaissance now. You think so? Our first woman president. <laughs> But then well, women will be rising. Uh, well, uh, otherwise we've been we've yes. been pretty much sterilized, the Americans. But you see, the prospect of of, of of a woman president is bringing out all kind of I know uh, strange well, first, things. First, the black guy. That turns out in this wasn't culture. wasn't even black. He was only half black. You know? yeah. <laughs> and he brought out all yeah, that I crazy know, stuff. Of course, and yes. And now it's the thing. And it would have been um, Bernie would have been great too. First yeah. Jewish president. Oh, all I, the anti semitism would have been would great. Have yes. Out. Yes. Second, second Jewish president, though. Yeah. Second, there was another one. Uh -huh. Abe Lincoln was Jewish. Really? Yes. Seriously. Oh, interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think so. I, mean, I the, thought you know, his, hair was, his hair was too dark for, uh, to be uh, Aryan. You, look, you can look it up. <laughs> he was Semitic after Abraham. all. <laughs> Abraham. <laughs> Abraham. That's his name. It was Abraham. You're right. So, so anyway, so yes, yeah, so America, you know, but, we, but on the other hand, I think we're also more crazy than the Europeans. I mean, so... You know, they're a little more crazy, our yeah. practitioners are. But the, the point of it, you know, um, which the Tibetan seems to have discovered, <laughs> is that when, when a student approaches the teaching, you do want to find out whether it's appropriate for you, That's whether true. it's genuine, whether, but after that, you really need, need to get into it, yeah. not to stay conflicted for yeah. 10 years. For, for, for You're example. wasting your time, in some sense. Well, in yeah. a way, it's good that students yeah. are critical about teachers. I think yeah. that's not a bad thing. Yeah. You know, although Americans have a very authoritarian... You, you have to vet them. Americans have very dependent personalities, yeah. and then they, they get it, they think that guru is mommy and daddy, and you go in some of those centers, and the, the, the disciples, they won't pee unless the guru says it's okay to go pee. No, I really, it's, some of them are really like that. And then, yeah. then that's really bad for the teacher. The teacher becomes very self-indulgent, and it's not a good thing, you know. So a little critical thing is, I think, a good thing. One thing they lack in Europe yeah. is in the undergraduate colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. They never have a course like in Buddhist studies, like uh -huh. what is basic yeah. Buddhism. They never have a lecture yeah. course like that. They only have these graduate seminar things yeah. where they study something about Buddhism. I, I just noticed philology. that ma many of the lamas established big centers in France, for well, instance. Well, you know, that's just some karma. They had some yeah. donors, and yeah. then they wanted to make big retreats and this kind yeah. of thing. France in particular, you know, but French, France had this terrible war on its I land. Know, yes, it Germany, is. I think yeah, Germans. Yeah. And uh, by the way, Russians, when you go to Russia to teach Buddhism, there's a tremendous hunger and serious concern for it. There is. But well, yeah. Putin suppressing a little bit, but the kind of people who Putin doesn't like. But there's a big hunger for that in, in, in Russia, too. Tremendous. Yeah. You know, and, you know, Russians were the first to really get into it, actually, because of the Mongolian Buddhist yeah. presence in Russia, you know. Russian intellectuals in the early 20th century. They were the leaders in Europe of studying Buddhism. Yeah. So, yeah. so they say, okay, now come on, no more stalling. Okay, How about so, the diamond so, way? <laughs> so, shoot, what, kind of, what do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> well, just like, what's the basic thing? I mean, what's, 
you, you know, how do you, you know, it grows out of Sufism, right? Your tradition originally, and it's it got to be it, your it grow, particular It grows revelation. out of true, na true nature. What's that? It grows out of true nature. True nature, yeah. It grows out of true nature. Oh, it grows out of, well, of it course, doesn't ultimate, grow out of any particular. It doesn't grow out of any particular tradition. I, I never belonged okay, to any part right. of the It's true, I grew up in the Middle East and all of yes. that, and there were Sufi influences yes. and all of that. So that, yes, I can't deny yes. that. But I, I didn't really follow uh, okay. one of the lineages of the of, of, of the so I like Ibn Arabi. I, I think he's great. I'm a good, a good friend of him, actually. I'm he's just a good reading friend this of biography mine. of Rumi that yeah. he was relating to the grandson of Ibn Arabi. In Konya, there was that very interesting. Yeah, that, that's it. I should time. read about it because uh, because Rumi and Ibn Arabi are the two sides of uh, yes, of, that's of, right. of the you, Sufism. They, they were conflictual yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. they're the two sides. They're complementary. Yes. and different Sufi orders, you know, combine them in di different right. different proportion. And the, so uh, Diamond uh, Way is your own independent the, the thing. Diamond, the Diamond approach, what I call the Diamond approach, is an independent thing. But it, it, it grew up actually in the United States. Uh -huh. It grew in the United States within the context of all these traditions. Yes. Buddhism, Vedanta, Sufism, yes. you know, all of these things. And basically, you know, uh, true nature is similar or thing to Buddha nature. Yes, in okay. Of, in terms of concept. Okay. In, t in terms of concept, it's a similar thing in the sense that we all have uh, a drive mm -hmm. to be free. Sure. And that drive is, is a force of uh, a truth, of a yes. reality. Yes. That Seeking we, of truth, yes. Yeah, that we don't see yes. ab apparently. Yes. And that uh, truth, that I go through nature, I, in the, in the diamond approach, I talk about the hierarchical, uh, the non-hierarchical yes. way. The hierarchical way is how to approach it gradually, yes. basically. First, recognizing it as some kind of presence that yes. is empty of other, uh -huh. not yet empty of self, yes. right? but empty of other, right? Yes. That's the empty of other, and it says it is its thing. Yes. And it's not constructed in the mind, yes. and not created by any personal uh -huh. thing, but it is what you are. Yes. What you are, mm -hmm. what constitutes your con consciousness. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, gradation of subtlety of that presence, uh -huh. until you get to recognize that when it gets very subtle, you realize this presence, which is pure isness, Okay. Is completely inseparable of non isness. Okay. The fact that it doesn't actually exist, it doesn't have an inherent existence. Okay. Although we've experienced it as the true existence. Okay. So the true existence, which is pure being, uh -huh. is completely inseparable from non being, okay. which is the absence of inherent existence. Yeah. So existence and non existence are two sides of the same thing. Okay, sure. And, and, and they are a conceptual dichotomy yes. because the truth itself is not conceptual. Yes. And, and so that's the hierarchical way. And that, is, that true nature, is, when I say a true nature, is a true nature of the human being, the true nature yes. of everything, the true nature of animals. Okay. So in that sense, and the true nature is indivisible. Yes and indestructible, yes. uh, unsol uh, unsolid, cannot be corrupted. Un unsolid, yes. And uh -huh. uh, uncorruptible. Yes. However, it doesn't have an existence like this computer. Yes. Right? But we can experience it. Yes. It, it is experiencing, but it is experiencing itself without it reifying itself. Okay. And the question of reification. Does it have any agenda of its own? It it's, doesn't have, it's naturally, spontaneously self-revealing okay. okay, and self-expressing. Yes. But it's not trying to get anywhere. Yes. So it's, 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 an, uh, it's an intelligence as non-thinking intelligence. Okay. It, 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 is, it is, in the sense, it is, uh, 
Is it ultimately an it's, it's very idea? similar, actually, to <laughs> my understanding of, of food and nature, okay. which, which I, I do have question whether they're exactly the same or not. I don't, I don't really know. No, I think not Vedanta, but it, well, I don't know, because yeah, what because, is the non-hierarchical path? Because, because in, uh, in the diamond approach, true nature, although it is important to understand it is pure awareness at some yes. point, is one yes. of its subtlety, yes. consciousness, awareness, empty awareness, emptiness, all of that yes. included in it. Yes. And, but at the same time, it, true nature also has qualities. It like has qualities? Like compassion. Okay. It makes, us be compa it makes compassion happen. So okay. compassion for me... Does it have qualities like compassion? It or is itself compassionate. Can it, can it be approached as if it were well, compassionate? Well, that is a good question. Okay. So that's that's what I was going to ask you about. Uh, no, no, I'm asking about you. About the gar. <laughs> well, it's between yeah. between yeah, the okay. two of us. So for for uh, diamond approach, true nature, emptiness, and compassion are not two things. Uh huh. Emptiness and compassion are not two things. Right. They are like the water and the wetness of the water. Okay. Good. And yeah, but I not only that. compassion. So yeah. is love. Yeah. Love and emptiness are not two things. Yes. Right. right? So we to go. Well, love to, and compassion to, aren't the same, really. Yeah. Love mm -hmm. and compassion are sort of, uh -huh. you know, you know, compassion. You don't want people to suffer. Uh, you know, love. love me, you want them to be, them happy. To be happy, right? right? So uh, love has a sweetness and a celebration and yeah. a liking and ecstasy yeah. and all of that. Although compassion can have its, uh, yeah, its sure. ecstasy, but also what uh, discovered in this path that intelligence uh -huh. is also a, a quality of true nature. Uh -huh. It is also an aspect, or a facet of true nature. Okay. In the sense, true nature is intelligent. Right. Without it being a being. Right. Right? It's right. not a being. It's not a thing. Well, but it... it okay. It, 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 it sounds uh, just the, like clear light of the void to me. It, it is. That's what I'm saying. Exactly the same as clear light of the void, I think. Okay. Sound, yes. Clear and then light there's of the this void. one thing that's very important, though, I think. Yes. If, okay. if it is, if it mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. and you do have the Vajra there, which, is the, which is, can be translated as diamond. Yes. As well as the scepter, the thunderbolt yes. scepter. Yeah. Which is a beautiful thing that Buddhism did in India. Exactly. Which yeah. is they turned the symbol of Indra's divine violence. Right. Yes. The thunderbolt. Yes. into a symbol of unbreakable compassion and yeah. love, you know, mm -hmm. which is a beautiful thing that, that Buddha did in India, really, yeah. with the Vedic culture there. So, so um, anyway, clear, so they, you know, when you die, right, or in the one slide I didn't show because I ran out of time, was the schema of the coarse, subtle, and super subtle mind. Yeah. And the coarse uh, mind and body of course, body has the five senses, one way of expressing it. Skin, you know, it's touch and so on. And then the consciousness of the five sense consciousnesses with the mental consciousness that coordinates them and has its also replicated inner world of sense yeah. awareness, you know, replicated sense awareness. So that's the coarse body mind. The subtle body mind is the uh, ner central nervous system, yeah. you know, the... the channels, winds, which just means energies, and drops, hormones, or essences, the centers, yeah. alchemical essences, red sulfur, yes. and, and silver mercury, right, yeah. and uh, alchemical thing. Alchemical alembic is the mm -hmm. subtle body, yes. and the subtle mind is three luminosities, yeah. the moonlit, sunlit, and darklit mm -hmm. luminosities, you mm -hmm. know, white, red, and black. Okay, now that and you mentioned wait, that, wait, 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 wait. I have a question about the, that. I'll, okay, I'll come back we'll to that. Yeah. Then the super subtle yes. body mind, yeah. in a way, the body is clear light of the void, right. the substance, yeah. and the mind is bliss, super bliss. Yeah. Not any kind of bliss, but yeah. the particularly mm -hmm. orgasmic bliss, you yeah. will, you know, that is, that is total nervous system. So... And, but really, that, that clear light of the void and that bliss, the intelligence is actually the intelligence of bliss. And uh, it, that it's the bliss mind that has that intelligence. And, and, and that is the deepest one. And if anyone's conscious at that level, they're a Buddha. That's automatic. You know? yeah. 
So that's the diamond, and that's the symbol of that. The word Vajra, yeah. or diamond, in all of the Anaxal Yoga Tantras and in Dzogchen or anything, uh, Vajra, and it, coming from India, not just Tibet, but Tibet keeps it alive, uh, Vajra means that energy, that place of body, mind, non duality, yeah. of bliss, void, indivisible, they call it, you know, bliss, yeah. void, indivisible. Mm -hmm. So male, female, essences, blah, blah, blah. So, but the one thing about it is that it's like, and I don't understand this, Deepak could probably tell us about it, or any, and some really good quantum physicist. There's this thing about the infinite energy of the vacuum yeah. in quantum physics that mathematically, the sort of quiescence or the stillness of the vacuum is, inf is still because the energy is infinite, so it doesn't do anything on its own. Everything is already done. Yeah. And it seems that they're, they're, they're noodling around the area of the diamond true nature you're talking about okay. and the clear light of the void. Yeah. And clear light of the void is kind of, um, uh, it's, like, uh, it's like the void as substance. Yeah. as an inconceivable substance. Mm -hmm. And it's all inconceivable, like action at a distance, magicality, mm -hmm. whatever you want is all there, possible there, you know. And, and Shentong, the Shentong philosophy came out of that. The guy who yes. started it in Tibet uh -huh. was a guy who had a big vision of that, and mm -hmm. then he transposed it back into the critical philosophy area where maybe it wasn't really quite useful, but then so there was a lot of controversy about it. But, but in a way, he was trying to open the door to that experience that he had, which was a wonderful experience. Nobody questions that. Yeah. So, so, um, so if, if, that's, if that's the same, if true nature is the same as that, then that's, that is really, really yeah. wonderful meeting yeah. of Vajrayana. Now, another point about Vajrayana, I just want to say, yeah. like in Nagarjuna's five stages, yeah. he makes very clear that the people who are adepts at that level, yeah. They are not interested in, in orthodox or institutional Buddhism, institutional Shaivism, institutional Vaishnavism, which are the religions they're talking about in his time in India. They're not interested in that. And, they, and there are yogis of those other traditions who are in it. And I would say that some sort of Sufi thing, yes. and, there, and maybe yeah. some Kabbalah, all the Hasidic, all the, yeah. and whatever level, Taoists, they all meet there, actually, yeah. I think. Yeah. I think. You know. and, and that's what you have independently yourself yeah. have seemed to have discovered. I'm uh, delighted. Yeah, well... <laughs> Is that right? M me too, yes. <laughs> <laughs> me, me too, although I don't exist as conventionally. What? I don't exist conventionally, though. Yeah. I, I am delighted, and you're delighted, when neither of us exist in a conventional way. We don't exist or in insist? We don't exist. Conventionally? Conventionally. Well, what, why not? What's wrong well, with well, existing we, conventionally? We, we exist conventionally, but that's it. Oh, I see. We don't exist absolutely. That's oh, yeah, that's, that's right. That's, that's right. what you're saying. That's, that's right. I, I, I reversed We absolutely it. only can uh, exist we, 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 we absolutely <laughs> don't exist, but conventionally <laughs> we exist, and we appear, basically. Yes. We appear, and we function, we love, yeah. and all of that, but we don't take ourselves seriously. But the key thing, you see, where Shentong yeah. makes the problem yeah. is that uh, it's like the, the Iron Man suit, you know? Yeah. It's like if the suit takes over, yeah. in other words, there's a danger of the, with the Shendong thing yeah. to, to, for people to think that voidness itself is doing something. And then they just become not responsible for what they do because it's just expressing itself through them. Yeah, yeah. So, but the voidness. Really, Shantung instantly. Yeah, that? that's that's I the problem that. with Shantung. Oh, that I that see. is actually its problem. Yeah, no, I don't take that view. I think we're still responsible because yes. because I'm. Because we only draw I, from the infinite. Yeah, yeah. Diamond because level. I'm. I don't exist, but at the same time, as a person, I'm responsible. Yes, right. That, that's that's my right. view. But that brings in, in another question. You were describing. Yes. You just, you, 11 you, minutes, what? Yeah, we have time, I know. So we, we d describing the, the subtle and super subtle, I mean, I'm talking about the clear oh, yeah, light. Oh yeah, about the three about, lights. About the c clear light. Now, I, know, I notice there's a lot, in Buddhism uses the language of clear light. The, the one? C language of clear light. Talk about clear light. Yeah, yeah, that's the and, bottom uh, one. Yeah, they talk about the clear light. One. When I look at the lamas, especially the quite accomplished lamas, I do see clarity, I see transparency, I see, yes. I see no self. Yes. However... With some lamas that you've met? Yeah. I mean, like... 
Good. The Jim Rinpoche, like uh, the Karmapa the 16th. Yes. You know, those people. I see the clarity, I see the yeah, transparency, sure. I see no self. Sure. However, when I look deep inside, it's very dark, very black. You see some who look black? All of them, deep inside, are very black. They're not clear. They're, they're black in a shiny way. Oh, they're shiny, shiny black, yeah. They're well, shiny black, and they're dark. Well, but they don't talk about black. They always talk about clear. But clear, usually, but wait, when people wait. use the word clear, means no color. No, no, but clear is there's an analogy. I mean, yeah. all of this is inconceivable, of course, but there's yeah, an so analogy. Yeah, so that's why I wanted to ask you about the that. The analogy of the white level yes. is, is moonlit sky with yeah. no moon, but just moonlight suffusing sky. Right. The analogy, clear sky, no clouds. Yeah. The analogy of the, what that, I call that level the luminance level, I call yeah. it. Yeah. They have some dumb words Hopkins yeah. has, but don't worry about it. The, the, the red one, or orange, is the solar one. Yeah. And that's a very harsh, bright, reddish, uh, orange light. And that's, I call that radiance. And then the, the next one, which is uh, black, so, so black that yeah. it's uh, luminous black, that's luminous. but it's totally dark. Really it's dark. A bright dark, you could right. say. That's called imminence, with yeah. an I, meaning something is about to happen. Yeah. Clear light, the analogy, that's midnight sky. Yeah. They, with no moon, you know, no yeah. stars. The, the clear light is pre-dawn twilight. You yeah. can see your hand. So that's more like gray. You can see your, yeah, clear light is pre-dawn twilight. You can see your hand, but you can't see the lines on the palm. Yeah. It's the analogy. Yeah. So it's like glass, you know. Glass is transparent, yeah. but what is its own color when it's not transmitting light? Yeah. It's not a bright light, and it's not dark. Everything is transparent at that level where it is, there's no shadows. So everything yeah. illuminates itself, and you don't need any bright light, and you have no, shadow, no obstruction of shadow. But it's, it, yeah. it's not brilliant, mm -hmm. but it's not dark. I have a student who likes my yeah. translation, luminance, radiance, and imminence. Yeah. So he was tempted, as I was, to yeah. call the final one brilliance, which is a German word for diamond, as you know. Brilliant. How about the but I don't call it that because yeah. those other ones are brilliant. Yeah, how about the gray? Transparency is. How about the gray light? Yeah, it is gray. It is gray. Gray, which, which is, That's what it is. Not, not clear or black or no, sort of No, but what is clear means transparent. Yeah. It, the but clear all, is the, the point. That's why clear all, light is misleading. They're all transparent. You know, like the hippie, you yeah. know, who no doubt got to the subtle mind and they say, I saw the white light. Yeah. Or but, then the guy but, who sees the sunlight. But, Bob, but those they're, are still they're, they're, they're all transparent. Light. What? They're all transparent. Yeah, well, the, this all. deepest one they're is all, all of it. Yeah. Well, from its point of view, it's all of it. I see. But so from the, here, the deepest it's far one means they're more inclusive. It yeah. includes all of them. Yeah. Because they're all transparent, as far as I can see. Yeah, yeah. But well, I do see differences in the, well, even, the Lama. You know, but the, 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 the most accomplished one I see mostly uh, shiny black. Rarely that yes. I see gray. Yes. I've seen gray yeah. and some llamas. I know, it's, it's but rare. the thing about the really clear light, but, but that's, you but, can't see. Huh? If you, you can, only clear light, only bliss can see clear light. Not the eye. No, not the Not eye. the inner eye. When, only when bliss. I, when I say but I then see... What is bliss? What is bliss finally? Bliss is a total yeah, melting yeah, away yeah, from, yeah. from a separated self. When, when I say I, I see, there's no eye. Well, that's good. There's no eye. <laughs> Therefore, there's no, there's no it's eye. only a conventional no statement. No eye. I see it. And, and the, it, 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 it's, it's an identity it's tag. It's inexpressible. The eye is an identity tag. We need to have it. Yeah. Right? But I'm, that's not what I am. Yeah. Right? Okay. That is sort of the Rang yeah. Tong view. Yeah. From what I understand, the Dalai Lama talks about the eye is, is always uh, sort of an identity tag yes. that always follows you even through lifetimes. Yes. Right? Yeah, well, no, it, yeah, yeah. it changes constantly. It changes constantly. It's a, it yeah. flows. But, it's a but flow. there is an identity tag. So we use I. It's a However, flow. when we go to the Vedanta, I, they take the I seriously. Like Ramana Maharshi yeah. says, I am the Brahman. Yeah, I know. And he says, the Brahman is the true self. I know. But so then Brahma what? says, I have no self. Actually, yeah. you know, Brahma, in the yeah, Buddhist Sutra, what, what, in the Buddha Sutra yeah. Indra, when Buddha goes to teach his mother, yeah. In the Olympus, yeah. the Indian Olympus is called uh, Sudarshana. It's yeah. on top of Mount Meru, you know. 
in yeah. the, like Olympus, you know, on top of the mountain where Zeus is, and Indra is the ruler of that. Yeah. Right. And Buddha's mother, after giving birth, leaves to go there because she doesn't like the infrastructure in her husband's palace. <laughs> uh -huh. She doesn't like the plumbing. So yeah. she says, goodbye, I've given birth to Buddha, that's what I do, and I'm, back to, I'm going back to Indra's heaven of 33, it's called, the 33 heaven. So then Buddha promised her he would come and teach her the Abhidharma, uh -huh. poor thing, and the most <laughs> boring thing. And so he goes there. And then the, the other gods in the 33, where it's just where they have the jewel net of Indra, you know, like in the Avatamsaka, mm -hmm. and they don't want to go there and listen to yeah. Buddha teaching his mother. They think, you know, yeah. Buddha's going to give a class, and they want to have their party. They're always partying mm -hmm. the God, the yeah. desire realm gods. Those mm -hmm. are desire realm gods. So then Indra threatens them. He says, listen, guys, if you don't, guys and ladies, if you don't go listen to Buddha, when he's here teaching, the one time he comes up to heaven of 33 to teach us, if you don't listen to him, Brahma Shikin is coming down from a Kanishta, a much higher non-desire realm heaven where the Brahma, yeah, Brahma right. dwells. Yeah. And um, he's going to come down in the form of Panjashika, the one with the fivefold tie. He adopts a sort of regular looking body. And he comes down and he's going to like whip you. He's like the Zen guy with a stick, you know. Yeah. <laughs> he's going to make you listen. Yes. And so Brahma is a very avid disciple of the Buddha, in the Buddha's yeah, so, so it turned out uh, Buddha does, does have gods, except what? the gods are not the ultimate. Well, they're not the ultimate, yeah. Yeah, but they, there are gods. Yeah, they're, of course. They're, it's not they not have gods. They have Brahma. I mean, even in his enlightenment, I know. If you he, met, help he me met Brahman. To get the yeah. Dalai Lama to stop saying Buddhism is non-theistic. Yeah. He, but that's what they say in India yeah. about Buddhism and yeah. Jainism. Yeah in order to talk to the Vaishnavas and the Hindu and the Shaivas. Yeah. But I keep trying to tell them, you can't say that. Whoa, yeah. look at that. Yeah, we're running we out of time. And, so, and listen, what, thank what, you so much. Yeah, so uh, Bliss Void it's, it's fun. It's fun talking together. It but one, one thing I want to say, I'm glad you mentioned about the luminous black. Oh, good. The reason why yes. is difficult to find it's a Buddhist text. Most yes. lamas, yes. most Buddhists, you don't talk. They only well, talk about transparent. It's sky-like. That's know, all I they know. say. I know, I know. I, but I look and yeah. see, well, what's this luminous you know something? blackness shining? Buddha taught in, it why right don't away. they talk about it? Buddha taught it right away to the Theravada Buddhists. Yeah. Do you know what the four formless realms are? Yeah. Infinite space. I read about them, yeah. yeah. Infinite consciousness, mm -hmm. absolute nothingness, yeah. beyond consciousness and unconsciousness. Right. That's the Turiya for the Hindus, you know, because they're right. looking to escape yes, everything. all the Turiyas, right? right. That's Turiya. Okay. Infinite space yeah. is an expansion. Yeah. It's like gentle white moonlight. Mm -hmm. Then your consciousness wants to possess it because of its habit, and it explodes in it. That's mm -hmm. the sunlight. Mm -hmm. Then nothingness is like a darkness experience, and it's the only going, going unconscious. And then beyond conscious and unconscious, like beyond light and dark, yes. that's clear light. Yeah. But if you try to stick in those things, you become a deity of a formless realm, and you're stuck for aeons instead of becoming a happy yeah. Buddha. Yeah. So Buddha warned yes. his meditating disciples yes. by teaching those four things in a form of, you know, Formless planes, but we yeah. ran out of time. Yeah, but we're it, out of time. You will never find that in a book. That's what I thought. That's, that's from yeah, me. Yeah, that's what I that's thought. That's from me. Yes, but I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I well, thought you know the inside story. <laughs> well, that's the inside story. Thank you. You know, can I give you a Tibetan kiss with yes. the forehead? You know that? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. That's, that's a Tibetan it. kiss. Great.